Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Bond. I am the System Director of the Women's Heart Health Program and Dignity Health in Arizona, and I'm here with Dr. Schufeld. Hi, I'm Dr. Cassandra Schufeld. I'm Professor and Chair of the Division of Internal Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Florida and Associate Director of the Center for Women's Health Research at Mayo Clinic and the past president of the Menopause Society. Uh, we just finished a session today talking about cardiometabolic changes over the reproductive lifespan of women, and specifically from more of reproductive age um, through, the, through menopause. And so, Rachel, let's talk a little bit about what you were talking about in terms of the cardiometabolic changes, risk factors related to pregnancy. Absolutely. So when we think about uh, pregnancy in of itself, we like to think about it in the sense that it is a cardiac stress test. And oftentimes it could be a woman's first cardiovascular stress test. As a result of that, we want to ensure that their, the health of the female is optimized before they actually think about going into the pregnancy. What that entails is making sure that they're going for their well women checkup, they're having their blood pressures checked, their cholesterol checked, their blood sugar checked. They're talking about what would be a healthy diet, an exercise routine, and that would be in an ideal situation. But we know oftentimes many of these pregnancies are unintended, so there's not that opportunity to do that. And as a result of that, we actually do see these higher and higher rates of these adverse pregnancy outcomes like preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, premature labor, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, they are disproportionately affecting mainly women of color, specifically black women. And that's a lot of what we talked about today. But the good news is, is that if we capture these women and actually help them to understand what their risk factors are, and also us as clinicians ask the questions about these risks, we can prevent these poor outcomes from happening in the future. And are they more common? You mentioned black women, but are they also more common in women that have risk factors going into pregnancy? Absolutely. So when we think about those very traditional risk factors that I mentioned, like the just the uh, diabetes and the high cholesterol and the hypertension and even family history of cardiovascular disease, all of those do predispose them to the higher rates of these adverse pregnancy outcomes. And what's important and relevant to highlight is that this risk is not just during pregnancy. It can be actually beyond 20 years after the initial event, when many times these are women that are venturing into menopause, where your area of the world comes into the mix. And yeah. this is kind of where the beauty of our session, I think, kind of shows a suit because we talk a lot about the fact that the lifespan is so important because what happens during the reproductive years does impact the menopausal years as well. And I think for you, as somebody who specializes in menopause and reproductive health, when you yourself are managing women that are either 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 through menopause or let's say even more importantly perimenopausal, mm -hmm. are you also screening for many of these cardiometabolic risk factors and these adverse pregnancy outcomes? Uh, absolutely. I ask about adverse pregnancy outcomes in all of my intake questionnaires. I think that's important because I don't think a lot of women recognize that. It's not just about preeclampsia. It's about if you had high blood pressure that was only during pregnancy. So I do ask a lot about that. But the talk that we talked about today was what role does the menopause transition play in cardiometabolic health? And menopause transition defined is the period right before the final menstrual period. Menopause being the final menstrual period is really a diagnosis retrospectively, right? You, don't, you can't predict. You don't know when a woman will have her final menses, although we do know that the average age in the United States is 52. We know that women that go into early menopause, so under the age of 45 or even premature menopause, have higher risks for adverse cardiovascular events and even earlier if they have had surgical removal of their ovaries. And while that's not really a traditional um, recommended practice anymore, but when you're getting a hysterectomy, most, most guidelines now say to keep the ovaries in. There is a very large per percentage of women that are getting genetic testing and we really need to recognize that those women that get opt to get their ovaries removed, if they don't go on estrogen through the natural time of menopause, um, are they at increased risk? And that question still needs to be answered. Although you mentioned coming back to risk factors, and uh, I do screen all my women at menopause. I see it as an opportunity for prevention. Mm -hmm. It is a time of accelerated cardiovascular changes. It doesn't necessarily mean accelerated cardiovascular risk, but it means um, making sure that women understand that blood pressure starts to go up, 
changes to cholesterol panels start to occur with lower rates of estrogen. That doesn't mean putting women back on estrogen is gonna solve this, because we certainly know guidelines don't recommend hormone therapy for primary or secondary prevention of heart disease, but it's really recognizing that these are a pivotal time and an opportunity for preventing cardiovascular changes. I agree. And, you know, one question that I know we spoke about on the panel was the role, possibly the role that hormone therapy may play with perimenopausal women as it pertains to their future cardiovascular risk. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or is that an area that you think we need to maybe do a little bit more research in? Well, I certainly think it's been understudied. Perimenopause is is not well taught to clinicians. And a lot of women experience symptoms of hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia that we know all lead up to changes for cardiovascular health. So we do need the research, though, to answer, does giving women back hormones during that period of time um, can help optimize her cardiometabolic risk profile? Yes, we do know that giving hormone therapy at the time of menopause for symptoms is very relatively safe, and the risks, um, the benefits really outweigh the risks. We actually don't even see cardiovascular uh, risk until women are open well on it, and even those risks are much low. So I would take home from me is that perimenopause and menopause transition is an opportunity for prevention because we see increased blood pressure, lipid changes, uh, and we can actually see some structural changes in the vasculature, thickening of the carotid artery, um, subclinical, but but early signs. But it also is an opportunity to ask about hot flashes and night sweats and appropriately treat women because because they're just not getting it. They're not. I mean, they're not getting the treatment options that are out there and available. I concur. And you know, just even bringing up vasomotor symptoms. Uh, when we think about vasomotor symptoms in general, we have to go down the pathway of what it what impact that's having, not just at the endothelium, but also the hypothalamic pituitary um, mm-hmm. access and mm-hmm. the stressors and the hormone stressors that are being released. And it kind of ties back into what I had touched on when it came to those adverse pregnancy outcomes and the high mortality rates that we're seeing during pregnancy, mm-hmm. when it specifically in the black black women and women that are American Indian or Alaskan Native. As we know, psychosocial stressors are a leading cause um, at this moment in time when it comes to maternal mortality. And a big proponent or big reason that is, is because it does increase that allostatic load. It leads yeah. to premature cognitive and cardiovascular disease. So Everything is intertwined, yeah. these vasomotor symptoms, the stressors and the stress hormones that are being released as it pertains to cardiovascular health at really every stage every of stage. a female's lifespan. And your point was so well taken about the, the role of social determinants of health and how just subliminal opportunities to change can really impact maternal morbidity and mortality And then we have yet to see that impact on the future of menopausal health as well. Exactly. And that that was one thing that I was going to ask. Is there opportunity for us to actually see, are there disparities? I'm sure there are as it pertains to even the treatment of reproductive health and menopausal health. Um, I don't know if there are large studies out there or data that has really honed in on that. It hasn't been done yet. It hasn't been done. But it needs to. (laughs) It needs to. And you're, you're... a key term that you used was the obstetrical deserts, right? <laughs> yes. And, and I want to extend that and say there's probably a lot of menopausal deserts out there too, no pun intended, because menopause is pretty hot. Um, but but seeking and educating, starting at the level of medical students, because we're just not getting the education that we need to really make this pivotal change, to really make change outcomes because we can all, all look at the social determinants, we can look at the outcomes, we can bring up these topics, but it's really going to come back to this opportunity of teaching and teaching those that are coming up through education because this, is, this speaks volumes. As a cardiologist, you're the cardiology expert, cardioobstetric expert, as the menopause expert, we are different disciplines outside of reproductive and OB obstetrics and gynecology, and we need to partner with them as um, as well as make sure that those trainees that are coming up and being the next generation of physicians know that it's just not, it's beyond the bikini. We, we've got to get past that idea that women's health is only housed in one specialty. And I think conferences like this really, really do speak to that. 
I agree. And I would say that partnerships like this, a case in point, but even beyond just our specialties are really going to be what really moves the needle as it pertains to women's health. Our goal right now is to increase research, focus a lot of that research on cardio uh, reproductive health, cardio obstetric health, menopausal health, and make sure that we improve not just the outcomes, but also quality of care for many of our women that are suffering.